Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending our Investment Currents live event, the first of 2021. I am Chris Briscoe, Vice President and Wealth Advisor for Gerard. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, David Geibel, President of Gerard, and also Gerard's Chief Investment Officer, Tim Chubb. We have a great call lined up for you today. Of course, we'll be reviewing the fourth quarter and, and the year that was 2020. Uh, we'll talk about the state of the economy, COVID-19. Of course, we'll discuss uh, the election and we'll talk about some of our expectations for, for 2021. But before we get into all that, I'd, I'd like to pass it to our president, David Geibel, to say a few words and, and welcome you all. Dave? Great, thank you, Chris, I appreciate that. And I wanna thank everyone for taking some time out of their day to spend with us for our year-end investment currents. As Chris mentioned, I'm David Geibel, president of Gerard. Today actually marks a very exciting milestone for me. This is my 1,000th WebEx call over the last 12 months. It seems that this has been our only way to really communicate, not only with our clients, but with each other. So uh, never realized I would do so many WebEx calls over such a short period of time. Of course, I'm kidding, but it's been a lot. Also wanna thank Nicole Heverly and her team for putting this together and thank Chris Briscoe and Tim Chubb who spent a lot of time preparing for today. Um, our public relations team led by Nicole has done a fabulous job over the last 12 months helping our wealth team communicate with you, our clients. In the early part of the pandemic, if you recall, Gerard was putting out communications almost two times per week. We felt it was so important to communicate with you frequently and often during, our time, during that time. Our PR team was so helpful in getting that done. But mostly today, I wanted to come on here and thank you, our clients and business partners who've joined us for this call this afternoon. The last 12 months have been extraordinary, and we cannot thank you enough for your patience and perseverance during this time. As of the end of the year in 1231, Gerard's four lines of business assets crossed $4.1 billion. This is a record for our firm, and we're so proud of this accomplishment. But what really matters is who those assets belong to. They belong to you, our most valued clients. We manage pension funds for essential municipal workers and first responders, such as police officers. Our trust group manages assets for some of the most, our most vulnerable clients, whether it's a guardianship for a senior who can no longer pay their own bills or manage their own affairs, or a trust for a special needs person. Our retirement plans business, which manages 401ks, mostly works with small businesses. This group was hit hard in particular over the last 12 months. And our retirement plans group paid extra attention to make sure our clients stayed on track. And in our private client group, we work with aspirational clients, people who are trying to save money for their futures or for other, other loved ones in their family, or are actually drawing on the money they've saved over their lifetime because they're living out their retirement dream. This is a tremendous responsibility. And the 78 ladies and gentlemen at Gerard are working every day, helping you meet both your current and future goals. The team at Gerard is actually still working mostly remote, but we're always accessible to you, as am I. I can tell you that the team cannot wait to get back out to meet with you personally, whether it's for lunch, a cup of coffee, a meeting in one of our offices to go over your financial plan, or just a casual get together. We're really excited and hopeful to do that real soon. But as we continue to work remotely for the safety of our team, the investments we've made over the last several years in technology such as Black Diamond and Salesforce have been incredible assets for us. Our corporate IT infrastructure and our two outstanding custodians, TD Ameritrade and Charles Schwab have not missed a beat. As we reflect on all the challenges of 2020, most of us could not wait to turn the calendar to 2021. And we all hope for a better year. The end of the pandemic and a return to normal, whatever that may be. I wish I knew for certain we could tell you what exactly the next year is gonna bring. Tim's gonna to try his hardest, but in our business, there's so much that's out of our control. What is in our control though, is our relationship with you or our client. 
the service and expertise that we provide, our accessibility, our professionalism. And I can assure you that our focus will always be that. And we take great pride in being your trusted advisor in both the challenging times and in the good times. So I wanna thank you once again for working with Gerard. At the end of the session, we'll have a chat form if you should have any questions for me. Thank you, take care, have a safe and happy 2021. I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Thanks, Dave, well said. Um, before I hand it over to Tim, we do have some housekeeping items. Uh, first, you'll see on this slide, some disclosures on the screen regarding forward-looking statements and how we reference Gerard. So, so please take a minute to begin to read through. I'll give you a few seconds. And I should also mention that this presentation is being recorded. So if uh, you're not able to stay on for the duration of the call, or if you wanna watch this at a later date with family and friends uh, sometime in the future, please go to our website, which is meetgerard.com. That's M-E-E-T-G-I-R-A-R-D.com. Uh, the replay will probably be available in the next few days, but in the meantime, there's some additional information on the site that you may find interesting and informative. Also, as in past calls, we welcome you to send in any questions you may have. Uh, if you're looking at the presentation in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see the Q&A. All you have to do is click on the Q&A, and that'll allow you to enter your question, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. All right, so here we go, Tim. First off, the three of us, uh, you, myself, Dave, are actually in the office together. And, and, and although in different areas, different offices, social distance, masks when we're around each other, it was the first time that I've seen you in person in, in quite a while. And I think it might be maybe since March. So I'm inspired by this. I have to be honest, because like so many people, we couldn't wait for 2021, right? You go to bed on New Year's Eve and you wake up and it feels like Groundhog Day, right? It's just the same thing. We got three more months of winter. Uh, we're still trying to get through the vaccine. So a lot going on, but, but being here in the office again, New Year's upon us, it, it, it's all positive. And however, before we move on and focus on 2021, let's, let's, uh, let's go to the fourth quarter and revisit 2020 in the year that we all wanna forget one last time. Great, yeah, thanks, Chris. And um, definitely good to be back in the office. It's only been you know a handful so far this year um, due to everything. So it's it's um, good to see you and, and Dave in person. Um, of course, you know good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to really join us for our first economic and market update for the year. Um, as Chris had mentioned, it certainly goes without saying that 2020 was one of the most difficult and extraordinary you know, years in modern history. And as we say, good riddance uh, to the year that we hope not to repeat. Uh, with our country at war, with the coronavirus, with individual freedoms, with the election results. Uh, investors continue to enjoy strong growth in the markets in the fourth quarter, uh, and really throughout the bulk of, uh, as hard as that is to say, uh, 2020 to bring returns well in the positive territory as the year came to an end. And so instead of focusing on the third wave of COVID-19 cases, uh, investors found solace in the certainty and the continuation of the unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus and the positive news from the vaccine development on the distribution front, which set the tone for the last three months of the year uh, and the year unlike any other. So as Chris mentioned, we'll start by recapping the performance in the markets as, uh, before we take a dive into the economic landscape that, uh, in the current reality. Of course, we'll get into the election a little bit, unless you don't want to, <laughs> and um, you know, how that all might shape the markets in the months ahead. And as Chris mentioned, uh, we're eager to answer your questions and discuss what is on top of mind for you uh, after our prepared remarks. So here in the United States, uh, the, uh, the S&P 500 finished the year with a 12.15% gain for the quarter, bringing its total for over almost 18.5% uh, for the entirety of 2020. And despite the violent pandemic-driven sell-off that began in February and ended on March 23rd, the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States rose twice that of the average return of 8% since 1930. Small cap U.S. stocks, as measured by the Russell 2000, uh, really stole the show for the quarter, rising over 31% in the last three months, gaining just close to 20% uh, in the prior 12. Overseas, the indices for international stocks, as measured by the MSCI EFI, or Europe, Australasia, and the Far East, as well as the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, 
rose 16%, almost 20% for the quarter, respectively, uh, with a full year gain of uh, just about 8.25% uh, and 19% for the emerging market uh, benchmark. The two large contributors to outperformance for international equities relative to domestic equities for the quarter really came from strong economic data. Um, many countries outside the United States were able to uh, get their economy more reopened over the course of summer. Uh, and the U.S. dollar, as a result of uh, this growth outside the United States and some of the risk taking that we've seen within the market, also weakened the U.S. dollar, which benefited many of these companies and countries as well. In the bond market and fixed income, uh, we saw some modest returns relative to equities, but still positive on the last with the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Bond Index rising by about seven tenths of 1% for the fourth quarter, closing the year up over seven and a half percent. And the Bloomberg Barclays Municipal Bond Index trailed slightly, but still rose about 1.8% for the quarter and posted a return about 5.6% for the year. Lastly, uh, benchmark interest rates with a 10-year Treasury closed the year at 93 basis points, or just over nine-tenths of 1%. Um, this was up from seven-tenths of 1%, or 0.69, uh, from the prior quarter, but down from 1.88 uh, from the start of the year. And short-term rates like the two-year U.S. Treasury remained stable at 13 basis points, where it started and ended the quarter. And lastly, the 30-year Treasury yield uh, closed the year at 1.65%, which was down from 2.69% to start the year. And just as a reminder, yields move inversely to prices. Was uneven through the fourth quarter uh, with, with the strength we saw during the summer continuing in October um, and, and beginning to turn lower in, in November, and December. So, so we know how the markets perform. The question is, how did the economy and the, the labor market perform? Yeah, Chris, that's absolutely right. Um, you broke up there for a little bit uh, for, for me, but uh, I that. think your point was that, no, it's okay. Economic progress was, was definitely uneven for the quarter. Um, and the markets in the broader global economy are really faced with two major cross currents right now, which you know I think are, are pretty obvious. You know, One is the third wave of COVID-19 cases likely weighing down the economy. In the first half of the year, we had seen some weak economic data in November and December. Um, the economy really grew at a torrid pace, as we'll show you in a little bit with some of the GDP numbers uh, during the third quarter. And of course, the positive vaccine news and the conclusion of the election uh, raised expectations for the latter half of 2021 and really brought a lot of uh, certainty to the markets, which we lacked for uh, the bulk of the year. And so after contracting about 5% in the first quarter and 31%, unfortunately, in the second quarter, the U.S. economy rebounded by 33% in the third quarter of 2020 quickly snapping out of the first recession Americans have seen since the global financial crisis. The third quarter jump did not allow the economy to fully reach the output from earlier this year. Uh, it's about two thirds of the way back to its full recovery as we'll show you in the next slide. But the recent fiscal and monetary policy uh, and ample stimulus that we've seen should greatly alleviate fears about permanent economic scarring and provide the economy a relatively strong foundation as we start um, the, you know, the new year and turn the calendar. Uh, recent economic data has not been improving at the rate that we saw during the summer and early fall, uh, largely due to the COVID-19 cases and you know, uh, shutdown uh, in regionalized areas within our economy. But the sharp uh, economic shock that hit us in March, as I mentioned earlier, has only been partially offset. Uh, we're about, again, two thirds of the way there. And uh, employment numbers have struggled recently, and we got some jobless claims numbers uh, this morning, uh, really furthering, um, further compounding uh, the difficult year that we had. And so we've seen in some uh, recent economic indicators really through uh, latter part of November, December, and so far here in January, um, with a resurgence of jobless claims and modestly weak business surveys that we are seeing a bit of a softening. And so the labor market has begun to deteriorate a little bit of late, uh, with jobless claims beginning to rise and lagging behind uh, real gross domestic product. Um, as I mentioned, November and December employment reports were mostly disappointing, with the number of jobs being added slowing to 245,000 in November, uh, which is about what we would expect to see and what we were averaging for quite a while in the years leading up to 2020 on a monthly basis. Typically, we would expect to see, uh, obviously, a lot more jobs being added uh, you know, as the unemployment rate is at 6.7%. And in December, we saw non-farm payrolls actually decline by 140,000. So the unemployment rate has now edged lower to 6.7% during November uh, and actually maintained the same level during December, 
due to a lot of Americans leaving the workforce and participation rate going down. As I mentioned uh, today, the Department of Labor reported jobless claims rose by 181,000 to 965,000 last week, uh, which is the biggest weekly increase that we've seen since March 2020, and well above the weekly average of about 800,000. This year, the labor force has declined by approximately 4.1 million workers, and unemployment was up by about 4.8, meaning about 700,000 Americans have left the labor market either by being discouraged about finding uh, employment or by um, Americans retiring. So the good news uh, is that I think, you know, as you look and exclude government jobs uh, being added, you know, private payrolls, which is, you know, the, the heartbeat of America and small, medium, and even large sized businesses, uh, has actually been rising of late and, and better, you know, than some of the comparable reports from ADP. And so while the data has been a bit sluggish, it has been, I guess, beating expectations by a little bit. Um, and so that's been a positive aspect of um, the labor market. Another positive aspect has been, you know, the wage data. And uh, looking here as personal income, we've seen income rise to a record high to close the year. Uh, a lot of this has been support from, uh, it will be providing, excuse me, support for a strong holiday season and some really strong momentum coming into the new year from a spending perspective. And uh, personal income is income that Americans receive from wages and salaries, Social Security and other, other government benefits, such as all these stimulus checks that have been being sent out, um, dividends, interest, business ownership, and other sources. And these statistics can really offer some clues as to how Americans uh, are from a financial health and also uh, help us find, you know, what we were to expect about uh, con future consumer spending. And so the stimulus is, in effect, transfer payments to the U.S. consumer, which helped plug a hole uh, in the economy, being that you and me, the American consumer, about two-thirds of uh, gross domestic product for the country. And so obviously personal income rising has meaningfully offset uh, the declining income due to um, lost wages because of unemployment. Um, and, and so obviously the stimulus has done its job. The number of workers with jobs uh, peaked at 158.8 million last December before plunging to 24, excuse me, 25.4 million through April. And US employment rebounded by 16.2 million through December. And just to put that in perspective compared to the global financial crisis, it took about three years following the bottom in actually uh, March of 2009 uh, for the United States labor market to recover uh, the jobs that we've just done in the last nine months. And so obviously, again, the stimulus, uh, monumental stimulus, both in monetary and fiscal policy, has obviously done its job while ongoing social distancing and restrictions have weighed on service establishments. Um, and ultimately, the stimulus should continue to be supportive for these industries in the new year. Yeah, and, and pent up demand, you're, you're right about that. My family, uh, we're looking to do a lot of travel, about four Thanksgivings, two Christmases, so, so we have a lot going on once, once everything opens up. Uh, let's switch topics. It's been uh, an unprecedented year for fiscal and monetary stimulus, as we discussed during our last quarterly investor call, where we argued the size and scope of uh, uh, likely spared the global economy from another financial crisis. Uh, but now, nine months after alphabet soup from Fed and Congress, to what extent is the market being supported by that stimulus? Yeah, yeah Chris, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and today, as was the case for the bulk of last year, easy financial conditions have driven by, driven by accommodative monetary policy from the Fed, as well as other global central banks, as well as fiscal support that was much needed from Congress, have really been the key support for the market and the economy, as we just mentioned. Um, the recent acceleration and pace of economic activity clearly highlighted the need to provide additional support by, for those hit hardest by the pandemic, uh, which likely nudged Congress in reaching the $900 billion uh, pandemic relief bill, uh, just as the year closed on December 20th. This bill was aimed at containing the slowing economic growth this winter and supporting a solid vaccine-driven growth recovery in the spring and summer of 2021. The relief included direct income payments of about $600 per qualified individual, costing uh, about $166 billion. We also saw $130 billion for weekly supplemental insurance uh, for unemployment claims, as well as another $284 billion in the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, funding. Uh, in tandem with the next relief bill, Congress also voted on a $1.4 trillion package to fund the government through next September. This catch-all spending bill included a compromised uh, on the Federal Reserve's emergency lending facilities, leaving the door open for the Fed to establish new facilities in the future, effectively leaving their next, um, I guess, operating flexibility intact. 
A quick point on money supply, uh, as I think we're, we're getting close to that slide. Um, M2 money supply, which measures cash, checking deposit, uh, money market securities, um, has actually exploded this year and typically results in higher valuations and also higher stock prices. We've seen 25% of all dollars in circulation printed within the last nine months. Uh, and assets for money market funds have grown by a trillion dollars uh, from this time, uh, from now and uh, going back to a year prior, uh, this time last year. And so that should bode well for consumer spending later this year, as well as provide support for the capital markets, especially if a pullback unfolds. With regard to the Fed, uh, earlier this week, the Federal Open Market Committee met in their final meeting of the, or excuse me, earlier um, in, in, in that week, uh, when we got all the stimulus on December 20th, um, the Federal Open Market Committee or the Fed or the FOMC met in their final meeting of the year, uh, leaving interest rates at near zero and messaging it that it will not begin tapering its asset purchase program, otherwise known as quantitative easing or QE, until substantial further progress has been made towards the committee's maximum employment and price stability goals. And so as a reminder, the Fed or the FOMC really has two goals. One is maximum employment and the other price stability, which means in simpler non-economist terms that the unemployment rate nearing 3% and inflation stable right at two. In recent months, the Fed has been aggressively buying U.S. Treasury mortgage-backed securities to the tune of $120 billion per month, much like it did after the global financial crisis and three iterations of quantitative easing to stimulate the economy and by keeping a lid on long-term interest rates. Powell shared that the FOMC will warn markets well in advance, in quotes, uh, when the committee decides to begin tapering the amount of these purchases. And of course, short-term interest rates remain near zero, as we mentioned during our last presentation. And the FOMC has shared that they intend on keeping in that way until the economy sustains 2% inflation for a period of time. And again, the Fed has made a really important uh, deviation from its prior more proactive way of, of tightening monetary policy. They are now looking for 2% inflation uh, to be the average for a period as opposed to proactively raising rates and tightening monetary policy in anticipation of that. And uh, in Powell's last uh, conference of 2020, yeah, he mentioned um, in an interview with CNBC, Jeff Cox, whether he was concerned about asset valuations in light of the highly accommodative Fed policy. And he acknowledged why PE ratios or the price to earnings ratio for stocks are historically high uh, and may not be relevant in a world where we think the 10 year treasury yield is going to be lower than it has been uh, historically. So stocks are not overpriced in his words. Uh, in addition, he also mentioned that as a result of low interest rates, Companies have been able to handle their debt loads, even in a week period. We've seen uh, bond issuance explode over the course of 2020, uh, which likely will mean for companies to be able to pay dividends, buy back stock, pay down debt, uh, merger and acquisition activity is likely to pick up for the year, and just plain old reinvest back in their business. And so I, I view that as a, a significant tailwind um, for the coming year. Uh, the FOMC also appeared optimistic uh, due to the rollout of the vaccine, with the median members uh, of the committee expecting the unemployment rate in the United States to fall uh, to 5% by the end of the year, which was down from about 5.5% as they projected in their meeting in September. And the median projection for real GDP, according to Fed, uh, the FOMC that is, um, uh, for 2021 now stands at 4.2%, uh, which is up slightly from the 4% that they had projected uh, during the September meeting. Outside the United States, lots of stimulus. Uh, we've seen European Central Bank or ECB announcing it will continue to inject the Eurozone economy with more liquidity, warning that the economic crisis caused by the pandemic will likely linger into 2022, despite the vaccine rollout. Uh, we've also seen some additional spending when it comes to uh, what they call their Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, or PEPP, uh, very similar to our PPP program. I guess they couldn't copy us completely. Um, as well as in, the, in Japan, where the Bank of Japan, or BOJ, has continued their pledge to buy an unlimited amount of government bonds to keep borrowing costs low and help stimulate the economy as it grows out of the economic pain from the COVID-induced pandemic. So it's, it's all good stuff. And, you, you know, I can, I can talk about uh, monetary policy all day, but, but I, think, uh, I think we should spend some time on the election. And as I'm sure you're aware, it's, it's been in the spotlight for recent months, probably longer. It's been on my mind. It's been on everyone's mind, including clients, especially uh, in, in the past week. Uh, and quite frankly, with the amount of, of election coverage that I've consumed in the last few months, I'm, if I'm ever on a game show and I'm asked to fill in a map of the surrounding counties outside uh, Atlanta, I'm, I'm going to do well in it. So 
As we know, last week, the, the, the two Democratic challengers defeated the Republican incumbents in, in the runoff Senate race in Georgia and then bringing an end to the runoff election, closing out the election season pretty much, and, and solidifying the, the, the Democratic hold on both chambers of Congress as well as the White House. What are your thoughts on the election and how it may impact the economy and the markets in the next year? Yeah. Well, I think it's first, you know, really important to recognize that this was not the blue wave that many had predicted and the market had begun pricing in through really the bulk of summer. We really started to see the market uh, attempt to price in election expectations back in June and July, uh, leading up to the uh, uh, election results that we had first received in early November. And so, as you mentioned, Democrats, um, you know, while they are now controlling both the House and the Senate, they actually lost seats in the House, reducing their majority to just 10 uh, representatives and in the Senate uh, with the Georgia uh, runoff now resulting in a 50-50 split, uh, which was now the, the, I guess, the narrowest possible majority uh, coming from the president or the vice president rather's role as a tiebreaker. And so, you know, we argued back in October when, you know, we had our last quarterly call with, with clients that fiscal and monetary stimulus will ultimately dominate politics. And so far, the markets have agreed. Uh, after the dust has settled and despite the narrow edge Democrats have secured in Congress, many of Biden's uh, and the Biden administration's most impactful legislative priorities uh, to corporate earnings, such as tax reform or comprehensive clean energy initiatives, will require a super majority rather than a simple majority. And even legislative priorities that require a simple majority could be difficult to enact given the fairly moderate composition of the Senate and the potential for certain Democratic senators to vote against their party on some of the more controversial and expensive proposals. This reality will really require compromise in Washington, which I, I know uh, is going to be quite difficult in this climate, uh, and bills that do pass in our expectation will be likely very watered down versions to what has been proposed thus far uh, during campaign season. I think at 7.30 tonight, uh, we'll hear a bit more from uh, President-elect Biden about what his economic uh, and, and, and stimulus plan will look like. And so this is not to say that change is impossible under the new regime, uh, but you can be sure that there'll be a, a challenge every turn as Republicans look to win back uh, the majority during the 2022 midterm elections. And so uh, while I was glad to have this election season over, uh, <laughs> I guess we're already thinking about uh, what has become uh, next year already. Uh, the recent composition in Congress actually provides good context for when Republicans with full control of Congress failed to repeal the Affordable Care Act back in 2017 uh, through the reconciliation process, which can only be used once per year. And it took nearly a year after that to pass tax cuts that we got at the end of 2017. And so with all that said, Democrats winning back the Senate does have some immediate implications such as allowing Democrats to confirm Biden's cabinet picks a bit easier, reversing some of the deregulation that President Trump had supported, uh, mainly in the financial and energy sectors. Uh, but it will also make it easy for President-elect Biden to confirm um, some new uh, a vacant board seat on the Fed, as well as potentially confirming uh, a replacement uh, should Biden uh, prefer to, to move on from Fed Chair Jerome Powell when his term ends in about a year. And so more significant, though, is the implications for the fiscal response to the pandemic. And simply put, uh, the Democratic-controlled uh, Senate, as well as House, will make it easier for additional stimulus in the months ahead, something that will maybe sorely need it when benefits for unemployment, uh, again, expire at the end of March. And this stimulus, alongside the natural recovery that we expect over the course of 2021, will likely result in a swifter economic recovery, which, with legislative gridlock on larger, more consequential policies being created. I'd argue that it's a bit of a Goldilocks scenario for investors now. So that being said, and, and before we jump into questions submitted by those on the call, which there are some questions coming through, what, what are your overall thoughts on, on 2021, you know, both, both the good and, and the bad, and, and what do you see coming down the pipe? Yeah. So, you know, looking ahead, if the vaccine is light at the end of the tunnel, the current advance of COVID-19 virus is the not-so-gentle reminder that we're still in the tunnel. Um, the recent dip in economic activity, largely due to the self-imposed lockdowns, will soon be met with, obviously, a much brighter outlook as the vaccines are now being produced and distributed. We got some good news, uh, I believe that was earlier today, uh, or perhaps late last night, uh, with regard to another vaccine uh, that's one shot from Johnson & Johnson. And aside from the positive news that we've had in the last couple of months on the healthcare front, other tailwinds for the economy include bipartisan support for stimulus, 
an infrastructure bill post inauguration. Hopefully we'll get some context on that tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, we have this massive corporate cash hoard, excluding financials, um, which is over $2 trillion, which should have fuel capital investment, rebuilding of inventories, and surprisingly, uh, a very healthy U.S. consumer with a savings rate uh, high relative to history and debt uh, very low uh, relative to history. The American consumer uh, really in the past 12 uh, years coming out of the global financial crisis really did not lever up like they did uh, during um, the, the years leading up to the, the GFC. And so as a result, I think the U.S. consumer is really poised uh, to rebound extremely well, uh, especially as we get the economy back open and see that unemployment rate uh, drip down back down to 5%. And so despite some of these business closures and uh, many more struggling this winter and not to be uh, insensitive about it, there actually has been a spike in new business applications across a wide range of interest, uh, indus industries, excuse me. And so um, while we remain uh, pretty confident about the global economic recovery in 2021, expecting that global real GDP growth could eclipse 6%, we do not envision a double-dip recession, despite some of the slowing data, and the backdrop of historically low interest rates, historic monetary and fiscal policy, and now further certainty around the geopolitical landscape, uh, all are significant tailwinds likely to supercharge the economy, especially in the back half of next year if we're able to conquer the virus. And so, fortunately, we have commitments from the Fed and Congress and other global central banks and governments. Um, it's seemingly infinite stimulus will aid the economy through what we hope is the final uh, and temporary lockdown that we're going through right now. Uh, despite our optimism, there are some risks, of course. You know, the winter is bringing cold weather and a cooling economy. And uh, remember, you and me, the American consumer, contribute about two-thirds of economic output or gross domestic product or, or GDP. Um, so far, you know, investors have obviously looked past some of the recent data focused on the significant recovery and normalization that will take place in the second half of the year. And while the COVID crisis will remain the greatest impediment to economic progress, as usual, as this may, um, as this may be uh, said already, there is a risk that extraordinary amount of stimulus uh, is going to cause the economy so quickly and actually call it, could cause some market volatility. And while the Fed is committed to purchasing bonds until they deem appropriate, as we discussed earlier, tapering these purchases and therefore, therefore pulling away the proverbial punch bowl, much like they did back in 2013 uh, when they began tapering quantitative easing then and we had the quote unquote taper tantrum, it could come sooner than what the market is expecting if we see gains in the labor market that surpass our expectations or inflation that is uh, really being a result of the inventory rebuild as well as the money, pot, money supply exposure, explosion that we sent uh, or shared earlier. Um, being a bit greater than expected. And so, you know, there are some risks, you know, of course, in the delay distribution of the vaccine. There's risk in the rec uh, reluctance for the global population to become vaccinated, of course, preventing the economy from normalizing, uh, especially in economic sectors that heavily depend upon face-to-face -face interaction. And of course, there's also the risk that fiscally minded Democrats as well as Republicans are, will be reluctant to pass on their stimulus bill or an infrastructure bill um, um, and that's, you know, again, we'll get some more details on that later tonight, um, but it, it could be a risk, especially if the economy continues to rebound uh, more quickly than expected. Uh, vaccine distribution is a success, and it's not necessary, uh, per se, to spend a few more trillion dollars, perhaps, uh, to support the economy and, and plug that hole. And so while we think these um, outcomes are, are in the likelihood uh, remain fairly low, they would certainly present some unexpected challenges to the market, the economy, or both. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the meantime, you know, we view the COVID-19 crisis to remain as the greatest impediment to economic progress with new cases, hospitalizations and deaths still growing around the globe. And with the vaccine rollout underway, there's good reasons for the financial markets to be optimistic for the coming year as they you know, were, especially in November, December, and so far here in January. And while we'll most likely see some surprises in 2021, and we certainly have already had a few in the last 14 days, uh, as Dave mentioned, we're holding out hope that this year will be much better than 2020. Uh, for, for the moment, the economy is working through this shift to a lower gear. The disruption of COVID-19 has endured longer than most of us would have anticipated, but the recent news gives us hope that this tragedy uh, has an end point. And so additional stimulus and support has head off this lasting financial damage, proving to be a worthwhile investment. And for now, uh, we'll wait out the crisis um, during what will likely be a few more dark days uh, this winter.
Yeah, and here's looking forward to uh, the springtime and, and then uh, getting the vaccine and then finally rolling out. Uh, there, there are some questions that have come through. Uh, if you're ready for it, Tim, I'll, I'll read some of them off. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, can you reconcile poor economic figures, such as unemployment, workforce participation, long food lines, with reported holiday retail growth? Yeah, so, you know, retail sales, um, as I think we had shared in the slide earlier, has been better than what I have anticipated. I think really throughout this year, um, many investors and economists really underappreciated how quickly um, the, the economy would snap back because I think we underappreciate the amount of stimulus um, that has uh, impacted the economy. And so, you know, as we shared earlier in the personal income number, um, these transfer payments as a result of all the stimulus and all the money printing that we've seen so far, uh, has put you know money in the hands of the American consumer, uh, which has led to obviously an environment which has supported the economy, you know, bouncing back significantly in the third quarter by 33% from a GDP perspective. And so, you know, while there's no doubt many Americans are really struggling, many businesses, many uh, of those most vulnerable to this crisis, who especially work in a lot of the industries uh, which require face-to-face -face interaction, uh, we hope that the stimulus is you know a consolation for what everyone is going through right now, um, because it's you know as we can see from the economic data at the high level of things, um, you know, personal income is rising, which has been supportive of retail sales, uh, which obviously, you know, underscores the amount of stimulus we've had, but, you know, still unfortunate to see, you know, some of the, the horrible headlines and seeing food lines across our country uh, for Americans who are, are really struggling, you know, getting through um, the, the shutdown that many of the, the governors and, and localized governments have decided is appropriate to combat COVID. So ho hopefully that answered your question. Um, but, uh, you know, stimulus has led to an extraordinary amount of personal income for Americans, uh, which has really been support of the economy, including holiday retail sales. And um, earnings season is, you know, here upon us. We had some earnings yesterday from a large um, big box retailer um, <clears throat> with a, a red logo. <laughs> Can't uh, get into some individual companies, but um, they, they had an unbelievable quarter, you know, from a retail, uh, an online sales growth perspective, just showing and underscoring um, that the economy is, you know, despite going through a bit of a slow patch right now, Americans still, you know, came out and spent quite a bit of money during the holiday season. Yeah, and here's one that, that uh, you and I have talked about before, and uh, there's, there's a number of clients uh, who might have pulled out of the market before the election due to concern, right? Maybe they put a portion on the side or maybe uh, they, they did all of it. Uh, what would you say, you know, election's done, the market has done what it's, kind of the opposite, or at least it's not as volatile as some would have expected, but what would you say the strategy strategy should be uh, going forward to, to get back into the market, knowing that one should be invested somewhat? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, great question. And, you know, as far as market time is concerned, it's never something that we're ever going to recommend uh, to, to clients. It's, you know, time in the market, not timing the market, because, you know, as of many investors who tried to time the market and let maybe some of their political persuasion um, impact some of their long-term financial judgment, um, you know, as we've seen in the last couple of months, it, it can be very difficult to, uh, while, you know, your political views may be one way, um, you know, ultimately the economy is going to keep chugging along and, and you know, uh, many of our colleagues on our investment committee will talk about, you know, when we wake up after election day, uh, what will things look like and, you know, will people go out and um, buy cell phones, you know, during the next upgrade cycle and all those sorts of things. And so, um, you know, if you had, if you did time the market, um, again, you know, despite valuations uh, being much higher now than they were back in November, uh, especially in the stock market, you know, we encourage you to start nibbling, um, you know, Think about maybe every week, every two weeks, every month, how much you'd feel comfortable getting back into the market and realize that uh, in many of our strategies, whether you're a client who owns one of our individual stock strategies uh, or you're utilizing mutual funds and ETFs, um, you have some portion, at least most of our clients have some portion of active management within their portfolio. And so while we can point to the entire S&P 500, uh, perhaps looking, you know, a bit overvalued in historical terms, you know, realize that, you know, interest rates are still extremely low, uh, investable assets are, are hard to find, uh, and the market, uh, given, you know, the amount of cash on the sidelines, uh, as well as the optimism for the end of this year and, and potentially 2021 remains pretty significant. And so um, I'd say, you know, start, you know, getting some money to work, you know, pick a, pick a frequency and stick to it um, that you feel comfortable with, whether it's, 
uh, if you, let's say you took, you know, several hundred thousand dollars out of equities, you know, prior to the election, um, you know, maybe divide it by six and over the next six weeks, just start nibbling at some of these companies, some of these um, investments that we've been recommending to you in your portfolio to help you get back into the market to appreciate the time in the market as opposed to uh, timing the market. And, you know, one of the things I had gotten into during our last economic update was really the four legs of this rally. Um, and so they were, you know, global monetary and fiscal policy has been absolutely enormous in size and scope and speed, uh, support the broader economy. Uh, real interest rates are negative. And if you look at the 10 year treasury, I think, it, you know, Right before our call, I saw it at 1.13%. You know, considering that inflation is expected to be about 1.6% this year, you're basically getting a negative real return over the next 10 years by investing in a 10 year uh, at these levels. And so that's obviously going to be supportive of credit markets on the fixed income side, as well as stocks as investors look to get capital work to meet their returns that they need for their financial plans, for you know, our clients who uh, our pension clients, obviously, have assumed rates of return that we're trying to uh, meet, and it requires us to be in the market to uh, 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 obviously expect those returns. Um, I'd argue, as much as we've seen some, some surveys out recently, that investor sentiment is not as stretched um, as you know maybe the media has portrayed and some of the speculation we've seen in certain pockets in the markets. Um, honestly, most of our conversations with investors are, you know, why is the market going up as much as it has been? Uh, as opposed, and, and you know, should we take some money off the table? As opposed to, how can we put you know the foot on the on the gas pedal even more? And then the last thing I mentioned is every day we're getting closer to a vaccine, and now it's here. Now distribution uh, is well underway, and so until one of those four legs of the markets gets you know kicked out from under us, it, it's really hard to be you know that negative on on the market's prospects, especially since the election outcome. Uh, in our opinion, is not likely to impact any of these four legs in a negative way. And so uh, I think any pullback, unless things change, should be seen nothing more as a technical correction and a buying opportunity, one that we would look to take advantage of uh, and realize why, P, realize why PE ratios are uh, close to record highs relative to um, you know, uh, their past. The equity risk premium and uh, other multiple uh, metrics, such as price to free cash flow, um, are you know basically at a 62 percentile, and so uh, again, every company is a bit different. Every sector, every industry group, um, not all of the market can be brought uh, paint. Uh, excuse me, uh, brushed with a, a broad stroke. And um, as far as you know, getting back into the markets, I do a little out of time rather than jumping in with uh, both feet or, or head first. Yeah, and I would add to that just this is it's the perfect time to to revisit your financial plan, right, and look at everything and say, okay, uh, I was pretty aggressive before the election I got out what should I do about getting back in and maybe you don't need to be as aggressive or maybe you can uh, restructure reallocate your portfolio but it is a good time to to revisit that that financial plan all right we have another one cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin have skyrocketed in value recently do you see an opportunity for investors in this space yeah great question um, so, you know, the first thing that I usually mention is there's a difference between Bitcoin um, from other cryptocurrencies, and the differences are very nuanced and unique, and you need a, a really high level of understanding to uh, comprehend what makes uh, each one have utility. And um, so having an understanding of the currency itself and having an understanding of the blockchain technology that's backing many of these cryptocurrencies. And so, you know, in our opinion, blockchain is a very – um, innovative uh, technology, this concept of a distributed ledger um, is, is really here to stay. And many companies uh, in our client portfolios are benefiting from blockchain uh, technology being adopted in many industries. Uh, a good example of you know, a business that may not you know, be around in 10 years would be title insurance for homes. Um, if blockchain and uh, tokenizing uh, certain assets such as homes becomes more popular, um, you know, the need for title insurance and, you know, piece of paper that says that um, this person indeed owns a home and, you know, obviously you're going to transfer that title to somebody else uh, may not be as much uh, necessary. So that's just one application of blockchain. And so my opinion, and I want to speak for everyone with our firm, is that um, blockchain technology is a really exciting investment opportunity, but I have yet to really, uh, in my opinion, comprehend um, why 
Bitcoin and why maybe other cryptocurrencies are going to be an asset that uh, ultimately will supplant, you know, um, the other developed currencies around the globe. And so I think the two questions, you know, outside of what I mentioned earlier, as far as, um, you know, blockchain versus cryptocurrency that you need to ask yourself is, do you think there's a greater risk of owning 5% of your investable assets in an unproven digital currency or 0%? And so, if, you know, you feel like there's a great risk of 5%, then don't buy. Uh, if you can't own, you know, 5% and, and something along those lines, it's, it's probably not something that um, you should be investing in, especially given how volatile it's been. Uh, and if you view, you know, a greater risk being 0% ownership, then like we had discussed in the last question, start dollar cost averaging, build up your position, thoroughly research the currency, thoroughly research the exchange, exchange excuse me, um, make sure that your wallet is secure. Um, and always ask yourself, you know, what makes Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency a better store of value than the U.S. dollar? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, as we've seen, especially within the last week, Bitcoin uh, plummeted over 20 percent in less than 18 hours. And so, you know, <clears throat> while uh, I know demand for the assets are very high right now, I think there are many investors who are just looking to make money and don't necessarily believe in the long term potential that a cryptocurrency could provide. Um, you know, global consumers. And so I think it's a lot of people who are really just looking uh, to participate in, you know, a, a bull market without knowledge or conviction in the technology backing it. And so uh, like anything else, do your research, know what you own. Again, ask yourself the question, is Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency a better store of value than the dollar? I'd argue we haven't seen that prove out yet. Um, and then ask yourself, you know, is there a greater risk of owning 5% of your investable assets uh, in a, an unproven digital currency or zero? Um, and depending upon how you, you feel about that answer uh, will potentially help dictate, you know, whether you should be a, a crypto investor or not. Great. Another question in is uh, the, the size, does the size of our national debt concern any of you for the health of the U.S. in the future? It, it does. Um, you know, in comparing the U.S. debt compared to GDP, uh, we are now over, you know, 100%. I believe the last I saw was 106%, meaning um, the goods and services we produce as a country on an annual basis uh, is now lower than, you know, the national debt. Um, the amount of stimulus that has been, I guess, produced within the last nine months um, and really going back over the last several years, it was absolutely necessary to help get the economy back on track and prevent a financial crisis. And so um, Jerome Powell um, answered a question earlier today during his press conference, it was unrelated to this one, but he said it's built, better to build strong levees than try to predict hurricanes. And so I guess my point in that, and, and why I love that phrase so much is, you know, working with an advisor, this is something that, you know, we take very seriously and we're watching very carefully. Um, I've spoken with a lot of really smart economists uh, over the years that, some very large institutions, and like me, they also feel like this is going to be a problem if we continue at the pace that we have uh, done. Um, but build strong levies within your portfolio and your financial plan, uh, rather than trying to you know, predict a hurricane or something that um, is really unknowable whether it'll actually occur or not, uh, whether investors will care. Um, you know, obviously the size of, of that care and that reaction uh, is very difficult to predict. And uh, many of these economists had said, and I tend to agree, uh, it's not going to be a problem uh, until it is, and it's going to be very uh, unpredictable uh, when that may be the case. And so, you know, part of what I hope we'll hear tonight um, as an American taxpayer is a plan to reduce the debt load. Um, that may mean, you know, higher taxes. And as, you know, pre President-elect Biden has suggested, you know, raising the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent uh, is a way to, to you know, help out, um, you know, the fiscal deficit situation that we're currently in. Uh, the last several years have not been, you know, the, the typical grand old party from a spending perspective. Uh, this year or the, the fiscal year that ended September 30th, we saw a $3 trillion dollar uh, fiscal deficit, you know, leading to a lot of obviously debt that had been taking on as a result of that. Uh, and the year prior, when you know the economy was seemingly good, we saw a trillion dollars in fiscal deficit, which you know exploded uh, our debt load a bit more. And so, I guess that in summary, I, I'm concerned about it. Um, I would like to see the rate of the fiscal deficit and the rate that we're accumulating debt uh, start to slow down. 
Uh, but with that said, I think the, the strong levy that we've built with the amount of stimulus we've had so far uh, have, has obviously kept us out of another financial crisis. I support the economy, I support the markets. And so, um, again, we'll be, I guess, you know, trying to predict that hurricane, you know, if, if it may come and, and keeping a watchful eye on it. Um, but for now, you know, we're, we're you know, here to, to obviously uh, watch things closely and help position your portfolio in a way um, that would help hedge and benefit from, um, I guess, some of those concerns. And so, you know, one example is owning international stocks. The dollar has declined uh, very significantly over the course of summer in the third and fourth quarter. Uh, which has led emerging market stocks and emerging market bonds and really uh, many of these countries with dollar denominated, dollar denominated debt um, to perform extremely well. And so, you know, typically as uh, debt levels rise, as fiscal deficits expand, as the dollar declines, um, it tends to be a good opportunity for emerging market and other international stocks. Uh, technology companies here in the United States attribute a lot of their um, revenue uh, from outside the U.S. and, you know, they'll benefit from a declining U.S. dollar. And so I would argue that a lot of our clients are pretty well hedged uh, against some of those fears that, you know, the debt load and the dollar weakness uh, ultimately will become a, a bit problematic. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll you know, obviously be very vigilant in, in making sure that there's, there's not, a, you know, something else that we need to um, be concerned about as well. And also, uh, a question came in about inflation. Uh, what's your longer range outlook on inflation, say three to five years out? <clears throat> the honest answer is I, I really have no idea. Um, you know, in the last 12 years, economists have been predicting inflation to pick up. And because of some of the, not some of, because of the massive secular um, growth uh, tailwinds and changes to the global economy, Obviously, globalization has contributed to um, really weight, weight, or excuse me, uh, inflation from being very subdued. And when you think about some of the things that drive inflation here in the United States, um, a very tight labor market tends to be, you know, a, really a, um, a key for inflation to pick up. And when we saw the unemployment rate get under 4%, we really started to see uh, wage growth, excuse me, pick up in, in many different areas, both on the top quartile earners who had been benefiting from capital markets rising, wages rising from as a result of that, uh, but also bottom quartile earners uh, were really unfortunately starting to see uh, their wages perk up and it was causing us to have a bit of inflation uh, towards the end of last year and earlier this year. And so I think for meaningful inflation to occur that's more permanent, uh, we'll likely need to see the economy to grow more quickly. Um, you know, the two, I guess, elements of inflation are, are you know, economic growth, uh, which can contribute, and of course, you know, fiscal deficits and, um, you know, spending money like we have. And so on the growth side of things, uh, again, due to some of this globalization, secular, um, I, I guess, growth, you know, tailwinds have, which have promoted uh, inflation uh, from being, uh, uh, you know, not normal uh, or, or um, what has been average. Uh, the, the growth side of the equation really comes back to population and productivity growth. And population growth in the United States is extremely low, less than 2% per year. And productivity growth has also been very stubbornly low, which has led to GDP, you know, failing to break 3% for, you know, basically the entire of the economic cycle. And so I guess my opinion is, you know, growth really needs to accelerate population and productivity growth need to pick up in order for growth to contribute to inflation. Uh, but it does worry me with the M2 money supply and the amount of dollars we've been printing, you know, how inflation might perk up this year. And it could be a headwind for stocks as the year continues. Um, where inflation is in three to five years is, is impossible to say. Um, the Federal Reserve themselves would tell you that it's really difficult to predict outside of the next 12 to 18 months. And so, you know, we think inflation for this year uh, as measured by personal consumption expenditures or PCE, which is what the Fed looks at, uh, is likely to be about 1.6%. Um, not likely, you know, to cause the Fed to, to need to raise rates or, or help, um, you know, tighten monetary policy to prevent the economy from overheating. Uh, but the, I guess the last point I'd make is the timing um, seems extremely unusual, you know, after all these years of not having much inflation in the economy, with the Fed now going to this average inflation targeting methodology, basically saying that they will wait longer to tighten monetary conditions um, as inflation gets closer to that 2% and looking for it to average 2% for a period of time. And so that could cause, uh, I suppose, inflation from 
um, or it could cause inflation from overshooting that 2% number, as the Fed, again, is not going to be nearly um, as active in, in responding and tightening monetary policy to prevent inflation from perking up too much. But we will get some this year. I think, you know, the inventory rebuild, I think the, the, depending upon the strength of the U.S. consumer, all those things contribute to maybe a bit more inflation than that 1.6% number. But, um, you know, like I said, I, I'm not really sure where, where inflation will be three to five years out, unfortunately. Wish I knew. All right. Um, talking about money markets and how they're paying basically next to nothing right now, where do you recommend or where do you suggest investors might go if they're looking to, to park basically cash and they want something that's, that they can get at and, and possibly earn, earn 1% or 2%? Uh, what do you see if, if we can talk about that? Yeah, you know, everything outside of money markets um, that pays a yield carries risk. Uh, whether it's investing in, you know, the 10-year Treasury, uh, 1.13, um, now that gets you where you need to go. Um, but after, you know, inflation, it's actually a negative real return uh, over, you know, the next 10 years. And so uh, you have, you know, purchasing power risk. Uh, if you buy corporate bonds, you have credit risk, you have interest rate risk. If you buy stocks, of course, you have, um, you know, risk that, you know, is existing uh, uh, within the equity markets from a volatility and economic expansion and contraction perspective. And so I, I wish I could tell you there's a silver bullet for that, um, you know, but there really isn't. This is what the Federal Reserve has designed, uh, you know, for us. It is to help investors uh, or, excuse me, it is to encourage investors to go out on the risk curve, to take on risk, to invest their money in corporate bonds and uh, securitized assets and equities to, you know, help stimulate the economy. And so, um, again, everything that's, you know, somewhere around 1% or 2% is going to cut, carry purchasing power, interest rate, you know, corporate credit risk and all those sorts of things. Um, unfortunately, the Fed themselves have said that they don't anticipate raising short-term rates, uh, which is the key driver for money market rates until 2024 or 2025. And so, you know, obviously your financial plan is extremely important. Um, you know, investors you really should have somewhere between three and six months worth of liquidity on the sidelines uh, in the event that there's a um, circumstance, you know, whether losing a job or an emergency or uh, having that rainy, rainy day fund is extremely important. But, you know, outside of that, you know, I think, you know, having a properly diversified portfolio, uh, investing in risk assets like stocks and bonds, um, especially, you know, while the getting is good. So, um, again, rates aren't going anywhere, and you know, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the money market um, funds themselves have seen uh, their balances grow by about a trillion dollars. And I would expect, you know, during the next market pullback, that you know, many investors will look to get some capital to work. Um, and we're seeing that actually start to happen now, despite you know stocks at record valuations. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you have any other comments, Chris, as far as financial planning is concerned, but. Uh, there's really no riskless asset that would yield you, you know, that one or two percent that you're looking for. And that's where it becomes uh, important to really look at what your expenses are and say, okay, how many months, like you said, three to six months maybe to cover expenses. But uh, given what's gone on in the past year, some clients might say, I, I feel more comfortable with a little more than that. And then they know that they're not going to earn as much, but it's also important to be able to sleep at night, right? That you have uh, certain expenses covered and, you know, not, not too much, you know, you don't want to have too much cash in there just for that reason, but uh, it, it is important to look at that and then to kind of budget things out. A couple other questions uh, that uh, we're, we're approaching five o'clock, so I'm going to write them down and, and, and we can get to, to them offline. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, we appreciate you guys taking the time. We thank you for the questions that were submitted uh, and we hope you found this, this helpful and informative. Again, visit our website, meetgerard.com and until next time, uh, please stay safe, stay healthy, and, and let us know if we can help in any way. Thanks a lot, and take care.